How are we going up the back? Are we good? I'd ask people to come in and sit down. We're going to start slightly early because I've inserted a couple of slides of my own just so I get the opportunity to have a little monologue. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Mike Ritchie. I'm the Managing Director of MRA Consulting. You are at the Strategy and Infrastructure uh, presentations. We're going to get 15 minutes from each of four speakers uh, with five minutes of question time after each speaker. Uh, and then we're going to knock off at 4.50 so we can all go and get dressed up in our finery to go off and get drunk on cheap red wine and wake up with hangovers and all the usual stuff that happens at coughs. Uh, a, a quick introduction from me while people are coming in. Uh, Waste is growing inexorably. So much for the circular economy, we have been singly unable to decouple economic growth from waste growth and waste generation. Uh, two thirds of our waste growth is due, to pop is due to per capita consumption, as someone mentioned in an earlier session today, and one third is population growth, uh, both of which are driving up uh, waste generation. The blue line is waste generation rates. The good news is the yellow line is recycling rates have grown from 7% 25 years ago to 60% now. The red line is the bad news, and that is that waste to landfills actually growing again. Uh, we've taken our foot off the pedal. We've had some setbacks with C and D waste, which has some set with asbestos, we've had some setbacks with MWU, uh, advanced waste treatment sector, and many of those tonnes are now no longer being recovered. So waste to landfills actually increasing again and it's 27 million tonnes. And the federal government, along with the states and the local government, said in 2019, all right, we're going to have some targets. We'll have an 80% diversion from landfill target, a 50% reduction in organics to landfill, and a 10% reduction in per capita consumption by 2030. They're all failing. The worst is the per capita generation rate has actually risen by 2.8% in the last five years, rather than reducing. So all the aspirations about a circular economy, you know, put it in context, waste per person's growing, per person across the economy, and we're just not hitting it at the kind of scale and intervention that we need to, to turn these trends around. There's only about two streams that are gonna hit the target by 2030, that's C and D in South Australia and Western Australia, and some MSW in South Australia, possibly WA. Um, we're just not, intervening in the market at nearly the speed we need to, which brings me, of course, to the Asala conversation, our first speaker, stay there, Asala, who's going to talk to us about the most important issue facing us, and that is the landfill levy, which drives so much of the uptake of recycling in the economy. That's where we need to get to. We need to raise recycling by 18 million tonnes uh, in the next six years, which is twice the rate of investment we've ever had in recycling in Australia's history. And we need to do that in, in six years. If we just followed the same trajectory, the yellow line, you see we get close, we're, but we're still 9 million tonnes a year short across the economy. And we've got to reduce waste to landfill from 27 million tonnes down to 14 million tonnes or a halving of our waste to landfill. On the positive side, the fact that we've had these big rises in landfill levies, which explains 70% of the increase in recycling in the economy, let me just say that again. Landfill levies explain 70% of the increase in recycling in the economy. We've gone from 7% in 1996 to 60% in 2022. That is brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Congratulations to you all. The key point, though, is it's underpinned by the economics of recycling, which are underpinned by the landfill taxes and landfill levy. They create the headroom for recyclers to enter the market and divert stuff from landfill. The unfortunate thing is we've got to get that to 80% and we've got to recycle another 18 million tonnes in six years. If we're going to recycle another 18 million tonnes, where are we going to get it? Waste is like a river, it flows downhill to the cheapest price. Landfill is still the cheapest price in most of Australia compared to recycling. What are we going to go and attack? We need to attack the stuff in the middle. Mixed commercial waste, which is currently contaminated with wet organic material, so it's hard, very hard and very uneconomic to recycle. 
7 million tonnes of organics, 6.5 million tonnes still of construction and demolition waste still going to landfill, 2.2 million tonnes of plastic and a million tonnes thereabouts of metal and, and textiles. You can see on the left the stuff that's really moving out of the waste stream at the moment is masonry, organics and metals. They recycle themselves, they've got enough economic value except the organics which are pump primed by local government. The stuff that governments fixate on on the right hand side and you know, look at the percentages, great to do but nothing like the sign of scale that we need to move the tonnes we need. And my little sarcastic comment in there, that's my Craig Rucastle comment, war on waste, coffee cups 0.0008% and the same is true of blister packs and balloons and all that other stuff. Great to do in terms of motivating the community but we're not the community, we're supposed to be the experts and we need to advise government, get in the middle. Get in the middle and give us the levers we need so we can get the investment, the $20 billion we need of investment by 2030 to get the big tons moving. Don't fixate on coffee cups. Last slide, I think. And that's that. We've got to avoid this. Our four panellists are going to tell us how, starting with the sailor, Apatatu. And the sailor is the Director of Policy and Strategy of Circular Economy of the New South Wales Environment Protection Agency. Uh, and his talk is ensuring our waste levy is fit for purpose. I've given him the context. He's going to tell you how he's going to use the levy to drive resource recovery in New South Wales. Over to you, a sailor. I don't know whether there's any more to add to that talk uh, after, after that. That's such a thorough introduction and a presentation on the context. Um, so um, let me make sure I got the clicker working. Okay, just uh, before um, before I um, get started, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country that we are um, meeting on. Um, as Tony, in his keynote address today, talked about um, how we, as the EPA, how we act and how we behave, how we learn, and um, we want to learn from the elders, past, present, and emerging that had looked after and uh, cared for this country, and we want to um, learn and embrace that, that thinking in the way we operate. So, um, so I, I don't think I need to do much introduction other than maybe talk about where we are at as government. So, Mike, thank you for the great introduction of what the waste levy is and what it does, so I'm going to skip over that bit. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> so, under the Waste and Sustainable Materials Strategy, which is the document from the previous government that so underpins the New South Wales government's work in circular economy, um, it, there was a commitment made to review the waste, uh, waste levy and a more uh, comprehensive, a comprehensive review. Um, that includes a, um, that's, that's also backed in by an Auditor General's report that sort of encouraged a review, a first principle review of the waste, waste, waste levy. That's why we are doing it. So where, where are we? we? Where we are right now today is um, we have completed a, a, a quite an intensive period of engagement with key opinion leaders to help us design the framing of the consultation for the waste levy review, and that's been incredibly rich, and I'll sh share some of the engagement that we have had uh, to date. And um, where we, what we want to do shortly is to be able to release that contextual paper, we call it in government issues paper, and to be able to start a more broad and more open conversation about what those, what those, um, what the levy means and what are the opportunities, what are some of the dangers, pitfalls that may, be, may sit with the, with the levy. Um, so, uh, and actually, actually, before I head down further, this is also worth pointing out that so the the levy itself is paid at the um, um, in where um, waste facilities that uh, that are in the um, metropolitan levy area and the regional levy, levy area. It's administered by the EPA, so EPA collects the levy revenue, and however, that levy, levy revenue goes uh, into the consolidated fund. So EPA doesn't make decisions on the, how the levy revenue is, is allocated, it just goes to the consolidated fund, and the 
government makes decisions through its expenditure review com committee around how the consolidated fund is allocated and, 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 and the work is done. So the, our role here is uh, very much separate from that work. It's very much around uh, policy advice. Again, EPA doesn't make a decision on what the levy amount is or the, that's a decision for government. We are just advising government on, on, on what we have heard and what, what, what the conversation has been so far. Um, so he, here are the basic outline of what the regional levy paying area and the, um, and the metropolitan levy paying area. And so to Mike's point, there are very wise economists, including Mike, that says there's a correlation between um, the levy, um, levy amount shifting ahead of the CPI, so not the, not the levy, shift, levy amount increase that's caused by the CPI or inflation, but when the levy moves ahead of the CPI, in, in, in further in advance of the CPI, that there's a correlation between landfill avoidance and, 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 and when you go into data, I am not one of those experts, but when, when the experts look at this, they tell me that there is a correlation. So that's the opportunity, and Mike talked to that, right? So that's the opportunity here. But um, actually, before I jump into the but, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to that. So, so that's, the, that's the opportunity. The problem, and again, Mike talked to this before, so we have, we have our, our resource recovery rates are plateaued, right? And we think, and again, this is preliminary, we think that's because the real, um, when you talk about inflation adjusted cost of the levy is no low, is, is diminishing against the performance of the economy or the sectors that are impacted by, by this. So we think there is an opportunity um, to potentially drive it, but it's again, no decisions yet. This is just exploratory, trying to understand what the, what the uh, opportunities and risks with it. So what does that mean? So one of the big concerns or the risks we have is, um, so who pays in the end? everything gets passed through, right? So it's, it's either the rate payer or the consumer that pays any increase in, in, in levy, right? So this is just, a, again, preliminary data. This is what we think the relative effect of the levy at a rate payer level is. So it's sort of stagnating. It's, it's actually stagnated for a period of time. And, it, when he, <clears throat> and again, numbers are quite preliminary, but if we actually put the real numbers in here, rather inflation adjusted numbers in here, we think it's diminishing, it's going, it's, it's going down, right? So, so there's, there is a, um, there's sort of the effect of the levy is sort of, so not, not only is it plateaued out, we suspect early, early, early data is saying it's actually diminished um, over time. It's probably because in South Africa's economies really perform exceptionally well over the last few pre-COVID years, it's probably that's probably what it is. Um, <clears throat> so, what did we do? So I alluded to that conversation we had with the uh, key opinion leaders. So that's industry, council. So we basically opened, opened those and said, hey, we want to sit down with you in, 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 in conversations. And again, you know, we're still doing these conversations as we are, we're going forward. Um, it was incredibly rich, incredibly powerful. Um, and we spent a great deal of time listening um, uh, not not coming with the answer because we we don't know how it's going to play. We can I, I I show you theoretics, but what what is it like? What's the day to day? How is it going to work? Right. So so that that's what we've been doing. We've just been listening. So there's been a it it was just exceptional, and I, I want to say, and I see many familiar faces out of that conversation, and so I'm incredibly grateful for your openness and the time that you spent with us and me asking really silly questions and, and putting up with me for, for, that, uh, for those, those periods of time. But the information we got was beyond the levy. Like we came to talk about the levy, but it was so rich in the sense that we talked about the whole system rather than necessarily the levy component. The levy component might have been about 20% of the conversation, because 80% was about everything else. Um, and we know, and again, <clears throat> in our advice to government, we will include that whole conversation rather than just the levy bit, because that, I think that's really important, that the levy itself doesn't sit in this vacuum. It actually sits in the, all of the whole system and its performance. 
So, what have we heard? I'm going to give you a bit of a reflection of summary. Our intention is to release a more comprehensive discussion paper, obviously issues paper, that will sort of, you can see the reflection, the whole thing reflected back to you with much more detail, but I'm just going to give you a feel for the summary of what's coming. Um, so this sort of, to group the thing, group the conversations, we think there were three sort of groups of things that we were discussing um, in, in, in these conversations. Uh, so like a, like a, a choir, a hymns, hymn sheet, singing from a hymn sheet, like the, all of, almost all recyclers say, levy is too, too low. Right? And, and it has not kept up particularly with the context of capital expenditure, that the capital borrowing, capital investment, and the land value increases in, in New South Wales. So that, that's, that's what they're saying. So the, their relative competitiveness against the landfill has diminished in a significant way uh, so that they, they no longer can, it's, recycling is no longer viable. Uh, but equally, and when you talk to councils, they're very concerned about the rates effect. Right? What, what does it mean to our rates? Right? Any shift in the levy, and that came through you know, just about every single council consult, uh, conversation that we had. There's also, from a CNI perspective, I talked about con, contract, um, commercial industrial perspective, though it's quite a small impact compared to the rates impact, um, there's a significant elements of concern around consumer impact, like in a, in a, in a, what does that mean? Like if you particularly target certain types of waste in the commercial industri um, industrial stream, what's the, what does that mean? So these are like, so you can, so you can see the um, constraints developing in this, con in this adjustment, right? Like this is, there's, there's opportunity, but at the same time, there are certain constraints that we have to work within to, to be, make a decision. Illegal dumping is another one that comes up, and, and illegal dump, there's a correlation with the rate of disposal and illegal dumping. Obviously, I don't need to tell you that. And, and then the other, other element is the levy boundaries. So, for example, if I don't mind me getting Hawkesbury Council colleagues in trouble here, but it's the, are those boundaries really reflect you in these days? about the economic activity and the recycling, um, where the recycling infrastructure should be. But then the constraint with that is closeness to infrastructure. So there's no point applying a levy where there is no ability to recycle, right? So that's, that's, the, that's the constraint that we heard. So the, um, the second pillar, and it's, it's much more nuanced, um, and it was very much about the fairness like so, so a, a company that's investing on a certain market size is a limited market, the base market, that's so sort of paying the levy, and then suddenly that levy, someone else comes in that's evading that levy, and and making it harder for those those companies to operate. Right. So that that was the second theme that came through very quietly, and I I learned a new one, new term, called levy washing. Where, where uh, transboundary move, uh, we are using state movements across, across, across state movements to wash the levy off the, off the material um, that, that comes through. And that's the issue. And I was talking to our colleagues in um, Victoria just actually today, yesterday. And, and one of the things that they, they raised is, uh, and uh, one of the things that they raised is the, um, tr the movement across boundary, and for us, Queensland boundary and the Victoria boundary. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a um, and then obviously another one is the pain around administration of the levy, like particularly around um, operational deductions. That seems to be a real pain point that came out like every, almost everyone came, said that. And I think there's a real, desire, there's a real need to there to make it easy to do the right thing and do the, do the, do the things. Um, um, so, and the, sorry, I should move on. Final pillar. Um, Amplifying circular economy outcomes, we call it, and Mike describes this as bringing bringing forward. So the, um, and I think I, I like how you described it to me the other day, which is like you said the levy sets the primary economic conditions that sort of enables the investment. But then, if you want to bring that investment forward, then you need to think about how you bring bring the in, incentivize that investment to bring forward. Um, 
So lack of infrastructure is a key one, and lack of infrastructure in the right places is a key message that came through in every single conversation that we had. And we have already started work on the infrastructure, trying to understand where that infrastructure needs to be and what the infrastructure problems investment in that infrastructure is with, with the infrastructure plan. And the first two chapters of it that we are working on at the moment is the food and garden organics infrastructure and the residual waste infrastructure. That's both metropolitan, and we know that's not just metropolitan. There are other local government areas that the residual waste infrastructure is a problem. So. So that, that's, a, that's the area that, that the, those are the two first chapters that we are working on, working on in that. Um, <clears throat> so, and then the other one that was quite more complex and I think we still need to deal with is that there was a real lack of confidence in investing in New South Wales um, because of the, some of the key decisions and some of the key decisions that I was constantly getting pointed to was the, what happened with MBU and how, how we sort of went about sort of stepping away from MWU, and then how the energy from waste policy and the um, infrastructure plan and guide came through. And contamination, and I think Gail bangs on to me, about every, every time I talk to her about this, uh, talks about contamination and how we need to think more about the, uh, how we protect the circular economy streams, particularly construction demolition and the food and garden organics and other, other organic streams from um, uh, contamination and how that can undermine investor confidence. So that's another area that we need to step into. And another quite a significant one, and was an interesting one for me, is around, and sort of slightly tangential, but I think it's very important still in this context, is around um, how the planning system interacts with the desire or the vision of the circular economy. And, and particularly from, if I can say, Blacktown Council was a very, very great, uh, we had a great conversation there around how planning system at the front end does, is not thinking about the services and the, way, the allocation of the places and the locations to be able to have an efficient and effective waste management system. And that's something we, we are very interested in exploring and very, and would part, I think we will deal with that as part of our infrastructure plan, um, plan work. So how do we want to go forward? Again, there was a, there's going to be a broader, much more open conversation on the back of the release of the issues paper coming up. But in the meantime, there are a few key things that we want to go uh, continue to work on. And we want to bring in, so that, for example, with our infrastructure plan work, we have, we're working with a group of key opinion leaders to help us understand the whole picture, not just the, so the view that the EPA has from where it sits. So we, we have industry, councils, um, everyone that sort of has a key view on, 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 on those to help us in terms of how we design that plan. In the same way, there are two things that I want to say that we want to do here, and there'll be many other things that will fall out, I suspect, in the consultation. But the one is the economic analysis. I think there are, you know, if you, if you get four economists in a the room, they probably come up with four different answers. I think we need to have a have a, have a sort of a consolidated view around that, create a bit of a panel of experts that can give us advice on, on that. And also, um, particularly around the administration, there are really niggly problems that are sitting in the administration of the levy that we can solve, solve without needing huge regulatory change or anything, anything like that. And I think you should just get going with that. And particularly the Hawkesbury, I mean, they talked about the pain that they had in um, when things move between their internal facilities. And, and just uh, how much, how complex the accounting system that they need to have to sort of try and try and um, try and um, account for the levy and and what administrative burden that it creates. So I think I think those type of things we don't need regulation change or significant changes. You can just in the way the practice works, we can change things. So that's where we are at, and I'm you know obviously happy to have questions and other things, but you know wait for the issues paper. Yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, we're talking about the levy, and you called it uh, levy washing into interstate, basically. 
Um, it's all great. The levy's a fantastic um, tool to increase recycling. Um, question is, though, we need to make it, um, I, I guess, consistent across the board, and I'm wondering by the board across the eastern seaboard, because we're finding a lot of waste going interstate um, purely and simply because there's no levy restriction, or not re reduced levies, um, depending on which state you go to. I applaud Victoria now increasing their levy to 169 next uh, this or next financial year. I'm assuming that they're going on the back that 3.6% increase to the New South Wales levy will be the same rate, so that's why they picked the 169. Is the New South Wales levy going to 169 this year? Uh, or oh, sorry, next financial year? And what are you doing into in regards to making it consistent across the eastern seaboard so you don't have this leakage interstate of waste because it's a it's a better opportunity for people to um, it's, move it's a really good question. And and um, so that, that I, I don't have an answer, but this is where we are thinking is at, right? So, so the um, let, let's start. So the, the economic conditions that underpin the sort of the differential between the levy uh, landfill disposal and the recycling rate, it looks like it's different between states to say state to state. Like so, the like say Greater Sydney versus Greater Melbourne and Greater Brisbane. The economic conditions are not the same. So the, the, so the, what and that's the preliminary. That's how our preliminary sort of conversations been, right? So, so, the to have the so say if you want a consistent recycling rate across Australia, we it may be that we might have to have different levies in different states because to accommodate for that competitive disadvantage in certain states, right? So that's one thing. It's not, not. It's not a decision. This is just what I what I sort of observed and heard, right? But then the other thing is that there's sort of two types of levy washing, so to speak. Like the one one is a legitimate movement of levy, um, say, um, so legitimate disposal of waste in another state, right? Like so, there there's actually a movement, say, from Sydney going all the way to Queensland, right? But then there is another movement that seems to be happening, which is to move something through ACT and then come back into New South Wales and dispose of it as New South Wales waste, ACT waste, right? And, and so you, you, and that's, a, that's a different type of thing again, and that different type of action that, that's sort of undermining confidence in the legitimate operators that are trying to do the right thing. So, so that, that's the two sort of things. So I, I don't have an answer. But I, I think ideally we would want that, but it depends on what the objective is. Object, whether the objective is to have the same levy or whether the objective is to drive the levy to get to ha uh, the re recycling rates, then it may be different. Yeah. I don't uh, No answer yet, but we'll show you the working when it comes out. Yeah, sorry about that. We could go on all day. Uh, our next speaker is Michael Bonanno, Technical Manager of CleanAway, and he's going to speak on key infrastructure supporting New South Wales government's waste and sustainable materials strategy. Michael, over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Coffs Waste Conference 2024. Uh, my name is Michael Bonanno. I'm here on behalf of CleanAway and I'm located at the Eastern Creek Organics Processing Facility. Uh, this presentation will focus on key infrastructure available in the Greater Sydney region and how it supports the New South Wales Waste and Sustainable Materials Strategy. I'll also provide some insight into what to look for when procuring a processing service. But my main purpose for this afternoon is to excite you, I think, to excite you about what's happening in Metro New South Wales. And um, let's hope I achieve that objective. First, I'll find the clicker. Here we go. So um, if you don't know about CleanAway, um, I'll let you know. But you know, those big blue trucks that run around, I'm, I'm sure you've seen them. Um, it employs about 7,500 people. So if you don't work at CleanAway or haven't worked at CleanAway, I'm sure you know someone who has or someone who, or who is currently working there. Um, there's 350 sites located around, around the country. It's been operating for about 50 years and delivering solutions for customers, communities, and the environment. 
Um, CleanAway provides sustainable waste management solutions to a range of customers, including local councils and small and large enterprises, as well as government agencies. And one of the key pillars for CleanAway, um, CleanAway strategy, which is Blueprint 2030, is investment in strategic infrastructure. Um, and that's really the main focus of what I want to talk about today. So just briefly on the waste and sustainable material strategy, um, there's a, I, I just want to talk about a focus of the waste and sustainable material strategy in relation to the, the, the Sydney metro region. Um, so I'm not talking to the whole strategy, just, just focusing on, on that region. Um, but in relation to recyclables, the strategy talked about um, that there's satisfactory MRF capacity available provided the current pipeline of facilities come online and that um, MRF upgrades are also required to improve, basically improve the product quality of the sorted materials coming out, including the plastic flaking and pelletizing and, and beneficiation to improve paper quality. Um, in relation to organics, the strategy talked about two and a half million tonnes of organics being sent to landfill in the financial year 2019. And the objective is to halve that amount of organics going to landfill by 2030 and also reduce the, uh, I guess, the emissions to net zero uh, by 2030 as well. So to achieve these goals, um, new facilities for organics are required to process combined food and garden organics in composting facilities and also provide um, facility for food only um, organics processing. Um, the other part to the infrastructure piece is to ensure there's transfer stations to bring the organics to the compost manufacturing facilities and bridge that gap where there's, there's a distance gap. So there's also much anticipation of an organics mandate, a, um, a mandate to collect organics. Um, and although um, many are waiting for that mandate, from the government as a clear signal. Uh, several Metro councils have chosen to secure their processing capacity ahead of the mandate. Uh, in terms of CleanAway's Blueprint 2030, this sets the strategic foundation to integrate and extend um, our leading network of infrastructure to provide that high circularity, low carbon solutions and a seamless service and value for money for our customers. The foundation basically sets, so the, the, the strategic framework sets the foundation for infrastructure investment across Australia, including energy from waste facilities in Victoria and Queensland, and um, resource recovery infrastructure in Sydney. Um, the Blueprint 2030 basically sets, is designed to set CleanAway up as a vertically integrated business in the waste management sector, uh, for example, in education. The um, Centre for Sustainability that we have is the largest waste education group in the country. Um, collections, we talked about the blue trucks. Um, processing, product manufacturing and closing the cycle from collection to commodity processing and end use markets. And an example of that end use um, market is CleanAway recently entered into a pre-feasibility assessment for plastics to pyrolysis oil project in Victoria with Viva Energy. CleanAway also has invested $280 million in New South Wales for the construction of the new Western Sydney MRF and the acquisition of the Global Renewables um, composting facility in Western Sydney. Uh, CleanAway is also investing further money into upgrading the Eastern Creek facility, which is also supported by the New South Wales Government Waste, uh, sorry, Organics Infrastructure Large and Small Grants. So over to the Western Sydney MRF, it's ideally located between the M4 and the M7 in, uh, in an industrial area in Blacktown City Council. I had to mention Blacktown City, thank you, Nicole. Do I get my drink at the end? Okay, thank you. Um, the challenge for all four speakers today is to mention Blacktown City Council. So, so, um, um, working with industry and Regulators and equipment partners, CleanAway set out to build a facility that exceeds industry expectation for material purity and reliability. The Western Sydney MRF project is expected to complete 
to be complete by the end of 2024 and fully commissioned midway through 2025. As part of CleanAway's commitment to environmental sustainability, the Western Sydney MRF site is designed to, um, to generate power from, from solar panels on the roof, to collect and reuse rainwater and to contain fire water. So if there's a fire, basically uh, an automatic valve shuts off so that the runoff doesn't end up in the local creek and, they can, and, and we can contain the water on site. The MRF has secured, we've got a heckler, haven't we? The MRF has secured startup volumes from our foundation partner, Blacktown City Council. That's two. <laughs> so the MRF is a 120,000 ton per annum uh, facility, and it's been designed in partnership with Australian Bale Press. And I was lucky enough to go out and have a look at it the other day. And this isn't just any old MRF, right? This is, is a pretty impressive facility. Yeah, the building and the, um, the fit-out alone is going to cost $70 million, so it's, it's not like any old MRF, this one. Um, the process utilises the latest in optical sorter technology um, and product purity to exceed the COAG requirements capable of, of above 99% product purity and turning, in turn securing reliable offtakes uh, for, the, for the recyclables. Um, the facility has also got, like one of the things that surprises you when you go there is the amount of money spent on the fire protection systems for this facility. Um, you have very early smoke detection systems, thermal cameras, full sprinkler system right throughout the site. The, the site's broken up into three separate sections, each with their own isolation piece. The, the waste material has separate bunkers to, again, isolate material from others. Um, the products are also um, kept separate. Um, it it's really is a, a huge, huge investment in keeping the facility protected from, from that risk of fire. And, and basically the principle of designing the facility for longevity and, um, and product purity. So, um, in terms of offtake, CleanAway pursues, pursues opportunities to process recyclable commodities um, and is involved in Circular Plastics Australia, which is a joint venture between PAC Group and CleanAway Waste Management, Asahi Beverages and Coca-Cola Euro-Pacific Partners um, with the 30,000 tonne PEC, PET recycling facility, which basically turns our bottles back into bottles. Over to organics. This is the fun part, I love organics. Um, CleanAway owns two indoor composting facilities in Sydney. On the left, you can see the Kemp's Creek Organics Processing Facility, which is licensed to take 120,000 tonnes per annum, um, which along with the Lucas Heights Organics Facility were purchased under the Suez um, Sydney asset sort of breakup, um, along with a couple of landfills and several transfer stations. Um, Shortly afterwards, CleanAway purchased the Global Renewables Eastern Creek facility, uh, which is licensed to process 220,000 tonnes per year. Both facilities process materials indoors. You can see the, there's biofilters. The buildings are, are contained with uh, negative air pressure um, and hard stands to withstand all weather, all weather conditions. Um, so, and, and then uh, as well, the network of transfer stations that CleanAway has at its, at its disposal allows councils to gain access to these facilities even if they're not located nearby. Um, we produce compliant products which are used to improve Australian soils and in established markets, uh, for example in agriculture markets, like we, we truly believe we want to return those nutrients back to the soils where they came from. Um, both facilities are really important for transitioning away from processing MSW and towards processing food and garden organics. And one of the features, well, the features about these facilities is they are ongoing and operating facilities with the know-how and the assets in place ready to service our customers. Um, we did some trials on FOGO. Um, this is a you can see a video of the trial that was done at Eastern Creek with FOGO. So we separated our composting process into two sections. You can see the FOGO um, at the bottom there and the MSW 
at the back. Um, so we process um, through this yellow gantry crane compost turning system called the Biomax system. Uh, the system we has, have has two augers and basically it turns, mix, mixes, shifts and aerates and hydrates the compost material. Our trials indicated we were able to achieve you know, very good pasteurization and high rates of stabilization at a fairly rapid rate. Um, we gathered data on waste composition and contamination and did many trials um, to look at how that decontamination process needs to look. Um, I also mentioned that we're investing another $40 million in upgrades to process large volumes of FOGO. And specifically for Eastern Creek, we're installing separation walls to segregate the FOGO from the MSW um, and to renew the Biomax equipment. So up on screen there is the equipment that we've purchased. We're turbocharging the existing bit of kit from a two auger system to a four auger system. It looks like fun. And, um, and we've also in included some upgrades that we've learned over the years in terms of where to improve this um, equipment. So it's an it's Italian bit of equipment uh, fabricated in Spain. And um, yeah, you're more than welcome to come out and have a look at our, our new toys. Um, uh, also, the products that we made have gone on to four, four trial sites um, around New South Wales. Um, they are agricultural trial sites on perennial and agricultural crops and pastures um, to prove the value of our products. Um, where are we? Oh, also, the extra $40 million investment is, is around covering the outdoor maturation area that we have and expanding the facility to, um, we've, we've, we've put in a DA to modify a development consent to expand the facility up to 300,000 tonnes per year. Uh, the waste audit, audits that we did during the trials have informed how our decontamination process needs to be configured. Um, over the last 12 months, CleanAway has been successful at securing FOGO from Fairfield, Parramatta and Blacktown councils. That's three. Um, processing will commence in June and three councils will consume about a third of our capacity um, as each of them come online. Um, the EPA has sent a very clear message about what, what FOGO is and um, the EPA's FOGO position statement clearly basically says food and garden organics with, with a little thing around um, some of the caddy liners and whether they're fibre based or Australian standard based caddy liners but food and garden organics is what FOGO is. Um, Based on our waste audits and trials, our facility upgrades include the capability to also face the reality that contamination will be in the bin. Um, we are expecting con contamination to be high, initially up to 20%. And really, that's just what our waste audit data showed when we did those trials. Um, our position is that we don't really want to upset the existing collection systems uh, where possible. FOGO collection should complement and be in addition to existing collections. Um, education is really important throughout this process to improve soil separation and technology is important to, uh, to remove any remaining contaminants that might be in there that shouldn't be. Okay, um, pricing structure is designed to reward the cleaner feedstock resulting in a win-win for the customer and the processor. I'm getting a hurry along, so let's hurry along. Um, so when procuring a, a processing service, a few questions to ask is, is there effective fire management built in? So yeah, there's been about 450 incidents of, um, of lithium ion battery fires over the past 18 months. So fire detection, fire response um, is, is really important and that collection of that fire water. What's the plan for managing contamination? Education and awareness to keep the contamination low and we talked about complementing rather than disrupting the existing collection system. At the same time, designing for the removal of that contaminant that, that might end up there. And what about other issues such as um, the ability to manage rejects from these facilities and, and to keep stockpiles low? Are there appropriate odour controls in place? And is there contingency for continued operation during inclement weather? And the, uh, one of Cleanaway's advantages is its, is its ability to leverage on other facilities 
to make sure there's a seamless service um, and we can provide that service no matter what. The other key feature to look for is offtake of, of products, so producing quality products to secure that reliable offtake market. Uh, and our approach is to favour reliable markets as opposed to more volatile or seasonal markets. All these factors come into play when looking for a reliable processor and procuring a world-class service. So just to finish up, CleanAway has invested $280 million in infrastructure in Western Sydney that supports the New South Wales-based and sustainable materials strategy. Our offering is to address the key issues affecting the industry, including community concerns in the environment, performance and reliability, inclement weather, fire protection, and quality products for reliable offtake markets. Our Western Sydney MRF is, is a game changer, um, setting a new standard for reliability and security of service for our customers. The investment in organics will see a doubling of FOGO processed in Sydney over the next year on the back of several councils getting ahead of, of any FOGO mandate. Capacity is filling and the message for you here is don't wait till it's too late and um, sign up to a processor you can be proud of and ask yourself what processing standard are you willing to accept? That's all. Thanks. Uh, it's super good to see um, the advanced fire safety standards that you mentioned about the MRF, especially uh, considering that we are from the ACT government and the fact that our MRF burnt down still hurts. Uh, um, I would just, I'm keen to know, you mentioned about the transfer stations and that's another area we are working on. Uh, is there any breakthrough or any special technology or engineering that you have applied to some of your transfer stations to avoid push pit falls or better resource recovery? So I missed the last part of the question. Um, so is there any special design or engineering that you have applied to any of your transfer station designs to improve uh, safety standards, especially around the push pit falls? That is a major concern with our facilities, especially transfer stations and push pits, and to ensure better resource recovery? Um, not quite up to speed on what we do with our transfer stations. We do have a transfer station expert, so come and see me afterwards and uh, we'll, we can uh, ask you about that. But ge generally, CleanAway's approach to safety is to be industry leading. So um, there have been a lot of changes around the way the landfills operate and our transfer stations operate to improve safety and improve safety culture. But specifically to your question, just come and see us after this and we'll try sure. and answer your question. All right. Uh, our next speaker is Brett Lem. Uh, Brett is the Executive Director of Waste Contractors and Recyclers Association of New South Wales, and the topic of his presentation is Infrastructure Hurdles Overcoming Barriers to Progress. All right. Um, thanks for the introduction. Um, so I'll try and speed this up to get us back on time. Maybe. There we go. Beautiful. So for those who don't know me, my name is Brett Lemin. I'm the Executive Director of Waste Contracts and Recyclers Association of New South Wales and ACT. Um, I recently took over, or not that recently, it's been about nine months from Tony Khoury. Um, the Waste Contracts and Recyclers Association has been around for 75 years, um, representing industry across various aspects from collection all the way through to recycling and processing. I've come from Victoria, um, where I worked in the industry for a number of years before then moving into association land, before then moving up to New South Wales to continue that. Um, so I'd welcome anyone to grab me afterwards and have a chat and introduce yourselves. So new, um, <clears throat> we've got some pretty ambitious plans and targets, well, the whole country does for 2030. Um, and we, we, those deadlines are fast approaching and we have a severe lack of infrastructure across this state and across this country. Um, and so we really need to move forward on 
getting some infrastructure built and hopefully overcoming some hurdles along the way. So in terms of the types of infrastructure we need across the state, it's really a bit of everything. We need something for residual waste management in its various forms. Recycling, MSW, CNI, CND, transfer stations, FOGO. We pretty much need a bit of everything if we're going to hit these targets, and we need it quickly. 2030 is not that far away. It's already been touched on, so I don't need to meet, need more infrastructure. Um, so why do we need this? Population growth, we've already touched on that. Um, the 2030 waste diversion targets, which are coming quickly. The export bans and having to do everything in-house when we really didn't have the infrastructure in place for that. Consumerism is increasing, we're seeing that, and the cost of living crisis is also driving that data as well, because um, we're just buying more cheap crap, basically, and throwing it away. Um, better technology, better processing technology is coming on board, so when we look at things like best practice, um, we can do things better, cleaner, faster, more efficiently, um, and we need to move with the technology that's available, which ties straight into there's a lot of ageing facilities out there that need a lot of love to be able to keep up with the contamination and types of materials that we're having coming through. Uh, encroachment. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen facilities now that literally have houses popping up across the road. This is a real problem um, with the type of materials that we're processing. And that ties right back into the loss, of, the loss of social license to operate. Without a social license to operate, our industry is in a dire situation. Um, so when we look at pathways, <clears throat> this is not something I would condone, but we've seen it across the country. People will build things, processes, etc., well before they have the correct permissions in place. <clears throat> The pathways themselves to building infrastructure can be quite complex, depending on what you're doing. In a perfect world, that all be state significant infrastructure, because that, with that you get additional government support and some roadblocks removed to be able to get this infrastructure up and running as quickly as possible. So obviously there's a lot of councils in the rooms. So when you look at local development, there's a lot of stuff that you're involved in there. Regionally significant developments, state significant developments, um, and then state significant infrastructure. Doesn't matter what you're doing though, the barriers tend to be the same, it's just depending on how big the barrier itself actually is. So the main barriers we're going to touch on, suitable location, planning approvals, EPA approvals, and the regulation stability. Location is one of the hardest ones. So as many of you are aware, there's not a lot of space in uh, Metro Sydney for facilities to be built. It's also extremely costly. On top of all of those, you then have that social license to operate and being allowed to operate your facility in the way it needs to be done. This also ties into best practice and the industry itself has an image that needs to be improved and we can only do that through best practice. Uh, traffic management is another one. There's many facilities with that encroachment coming on, trucks near residences, trucks near schools, etc. Big problem. And also, the roads being able to take the traffic and the weight of the vehicles coming through. Um, the recent rains just show that our road infrastructure needs a lot of love as well. Um, things like odour control, there's been a lot of stuff in the media with organics and odour control. Dust depression is another one. And the tyranny of distance, as these facilities get pushed further and further out of town, um, we have to factor in those costs, those greenhouse effects and things that go on there um, to make it commercially viable and affordable for all of us. Planning approvals. So depending on what you need, you've got your development applications, development consents, your environmental protection licenses, and there might be some other overlays on whatever you're trying to do. Um, and it might also include other federal laws and regulators as well. With planning approvals, because it is such a minefield, um, it's really important, I think, to have a quality consultant by your side to go through this process. Um, too many times, I've seen it, and I'm not even a consultant in this field, where there's been a development license that goes through that just lacks the basic understanding of the rules they're trying to put through, and in a, in a language that government wants to see it in. So anyone that's looking at those planning approvals, and it's the same for councils when you're looking at things. Consultation is really important when it comes to this area. EPA approvals is another one. A lot of the time, and I'm sure a lot of the EPA people in the room will also see this, when you're looking at your EPA approvals as they're coming through, um, you've probably written that approval in a fashion that you understand, 
but you're showing it to someone who might not understand the technology or the industry that you're trying to promote and get a license for. Um, I've put up there as another one. So Victoria, I don't know if there's one from Vic EPA in the room at the moment, but they're currently, their EPA approvals are out to 541 working days. So that's a big barrier, right? You're about two years there waiting. Um, so statutory deadline is 28 days. Um, they're at 541. So that is another barrier because it's a long time before you can start operating. Um, pathways to new technology. So we've heard uh, today and yesterday that EPA, New South Wales, are looking at pathways for new technology in the line of um, pilot programs, etc. It's a great opportunity for local councils to get involved with the industry, to create new infrastructure, new technologies, new jobs within your local government area. Um, but there still is a lack of guidance. There is definitely a lack of guidance um, throughout New South Wales on how to navigate through these. Um, and I just wanted to add in what, what does best practice look like? Because I think that's one thing that we all should be striving for. Every facility that's being built today or tomorrow, is we should be looking at what is best practice and continue to build best practice because that's how we get better and more efficient and better outcomes. Regulation stability. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so this is a big one. New South Wales especially has hurt from this in the not too distant uh, past in regards to MWU and AWTs. No one's going to invest unless they have certainty that the regulations are going to support their investments. You know, we're talking billions of dollars of investment, whether that's local government, industry, um, or even state government. We need to ensure that whatever we're building and implementing is going to be there for the long haul. Ooh. That's not what I see. <laughs> yeah, the full spread. Should be slide 30. There we go. Awesome. So in terms of solutions, I don't think there is one silver bullet solution for the issues that we face across industry when it comes to infrastructure. Um, but one thing that is definitely um, quite prominent is the fact that all of us need to be allies and working together. Local councils, state government, regulators and industry. It's the only way we're going to get together and get the infrastructure that we need in a way that works um, and gets the results that we need. Um, so you could, I could pass a microphone around the room and everyone would have a different solution. There's no one right or wrong answer. I mean, there's some definite wrong answers, but there's definitely no answer, like no silver bullet. Um, it's the same with the asbestos problem, driving, recycling, and getting those better outcomes. But one of the big ones I personally think that New South Wales should start to introduce is looking at that procurement model um, for state government, local government, when you're doing your procurement, you should be looking at recycled products to help drive that product push, because that's going to drive investment. That's going to drive innovation. We've seen that model work before in a very successful manner, and that's what we need to do moving forward to get that to happen. Um, so I said I'd rush through that to get us back on time. I did my best. Any questions? Beautiful. <laughs> Saving them all for you, a sailor. <laughs> no worries. We might, we might collar a few minutes to ask a sailor more questions at the end. Uh, uh, all right, and our last speaker is. Uh, Chris Godfrey. Uh, Chris is a partner or co-founder and partner of Sphere Infrastructure Partners. He's speaking on from vision to reality procurement packages for infrastructure delivery. Chris. Thanks, uh, Mike, and afternoon all. Uh, just get the clicker going. Just quickly on, uh, on Sphere, uh, we're a small consulting firm that uh, specialises on environmental projects, helping uh, deliver them from concept through the, the procurement uh, phase and then into, uh, into delivery phase, both uh, with private uh, sector and, uh, and public as well. Um, 
Myself, uh, yeah, uh, co-founder of Sphere, uh, have a background uh, with, uh, with Veolia, um, so uh, reasonably well ensconced into the, into the waste sector. I am, uh, I am a finance guy, so uh, depending uh, on whether you think this is the, the glass uh, half full or glass half empty, you've, you've got a bean counter talking about uh, procurement, which most people then link to purchasing, which then people link to uh, governance and the eyelids start to, to drop. Um, and I'm standing between you and the, uh, the Clash of the Titans uh, party. But uh, on the, the glass half full, um, they've saved the best for last. So uh, that's, uh, that's the way I look at it anyway. Um, what I'm aiming to talk through today, and, and really it's been a theme since, uh, since the kickoff uh, sessions with in particular Tony and, uh, and Bronwyn around uh, the infrastructure landscape. Uh, then look at fit for purpose procurement packages. Um, there is a challenge there. Um, it was touched on uh, in particular by Brett um, in, in reference to uh, how long it takes to get uh, projects from, from idea through to approvals, let alone into, into the procurement space. And then just some, some lessons learnt. We've, uh, we've done quite a few of these, uh, these projects. There's some good lessons uh, in there and uh, something for, for people to, to take away with. So the landscape, um, and I think uh, Tony made reference to the fact that they're developing uh, a waste infrastructure pipeline. I think Mike made reference to 20 odd billion uh, of the next uh, five years for, for waste specific infrastructure. And I even think uh, Bromman made reference to 237 billion on infrastructure in general over the next five years. And, and being a numbers man, um, that roughly works out to 130 million per day over the next five years that needs to be spent on infrastructure. And so people sitting there with, with projects uh, on the horizon need to take that into account. The market is simply not there to deliver that level of infrastructure given we're still coming out of the, the COVID challenges, the supply chain challenges. And, uh, and that really uh, is an important factor in how you take your projects to market. And, uh, and I'll talk about that uh, in a little bit more detail. But the pipeline's large, okay? And you are one sector uh, competing for, for scarce resources. Supply chain issues have been referenced before. There is kit that needs to come from abroad. There are uh, queues for people to get into or for organisations to get into to have kit manufactured. So to think it's uh, on the, off the back of a truck, um, let alone shipping uh, issues, uh, you need to think again. The local labour, um, you know, that's a hot topic at the moment in terms of, uh, we all hear about it in terms of, of uh, residential uh, uh, accommodation, but there is a, uh, a labour capacity issue in, in construction and uh, we've seen a number of construction entities go, uh, go bankrupt over the recent uh, one to two years uh, on the back of commercial conditions that have uh, put them under duress. And we can't ignore that. The, the wheel is turning in, in these organisations wanting to take on construction projects depending on the risk profile. And to ignore it and think that my project is more special than others, you'll do yourself and your project a, uh, a disservice. And, and that's really the construction sector in general. It's, uh, it is a challenging sector. It's come from a history where people love to have uh, hard dollar, hard time frame arrangements. That is, is shifting. Um, Organisations won't be that attracted to, to such projects if that's the only way that businesses want to go about procuring their infrastructure. So they are macro type issues, but they will affect uh, and they are affecting how we go about uh, procuring uh, infrastructure, whether that be waste specific or, uh, or more broadly. And that's just a, uh, a more detailed snapshot, um, really with an, a focus on the environmental sector, which is wastewater uh, and energy. Um, and yet, yeah, linking back to, to Tony's point earlier this morning, I think the fact that they're looking to develop a pipeline to give visibility is something we all should be looking forward to, because that will help get us front and centre with, uh, with the construction sector and the delivery sector for, for these projects. Um, but yeah, that's really just uh, in, in reference to a bit more detail. The procurement process itself, um, and this is not specific to local government or, or uh, private sector, 
Um, the key issue is about planning and uh, in talking to uh, a few colleagues uh, today, simply taking an approach of, of launching a, a you know, market sounding process into the market when uh, um, you're under pressure to, to make sure you're showing progress is just not really going to cut it in the, in the longer term of wanting to secure a good uh, delivery partner to, to, help, uh, to help deliver on your uh, commitments. You do need to plan, you do need to take into consideration uh, some of what the other speakers uh, have been talking about uh, earlier uh, in terms of, of the pipeline, in terms of the, the timeframes it take. Um, you do need to develop your, your commercial framework, and I'll, I'll come onto that in a little bit more detail. Uh, you need to engage with the market. Uh, you need to engage with them in a collaborative manner. And I'm saying this from a point of view of, of not telling you what to do, but what we see the market is looking for. Um, whether people choose to, uh, to take this on board is, is up to everyone uh, to think about. But in the environment that we're in, these are some of the important steps um, that, that should be considered. Um, and then when you're going to the market, I think it's important to, to relay a confidence around the project that you're looking to uh, uh, promote into the market. Going too early, people, when asked to respond to, to such uh, market soundings or otherwise, will think, oh, this project's years away, let's just do a cut and paste of a previous market sounding and, and give some information back to, to keep us in the, in the discussion. I think going forward with a market sounding process um, based on doing more pre-planning work uh, will drive greater benefit to, to organisations. And the areas that, that should be looked at uh, in terms of, of some of that pre-planning um, are really around the site um, that you're looking for, the infrastructure. Um, delving down into some of those issues, in particular one that always jumps out is, uh, is land contamination topics making sure you understand that what they exist or what conditions exist or not exist and if you're simply wanting to push that out to the, the delivery partner then understand that will flow back in terms of, of their willingness to actually even participate in the project and then if they do they will take a pricing factor uh, to that. But if you can do some upfront work in sight of identification and ground conditions that will help in, uh, in building confidence. Social licence, everyone understands the concept of that, but, under, but doing some pre-work on, on where you are with social licence in relation to your specific projects. Understanding your timelines for approvals. Yes, they vary from state to state, from, um, from EPA versus uh, DLA uh, on licensing. Um, and they need to be factored in and you need to build that into a program to then communicate back to the market. And then building up a commercial uh, and financial structure that, that makes sense, that uh, again, r racing out saying we want to build uh, a new recycling centre, um, putting a bit of effort into how, what the delivery model might look like for that facility uh, up front versus after you've gone to, to market sounding or after you've gone to EOI, will just give confidence to the market that these guys know what they're thinking about, they know how they'd like to deliver it, it aligns with their organisational strategy or, or doesn't, um, and uh, how, how the economics of the project at a high level um, look to stack up. And that will then give confidence to the market in, in responding. Um, yes, I've made reference to market soundings, but it'll give confidence through the whole procurement process. And so doing more of these steps up front as an organisation will only help in uh, trying to secure those partners who are going to be on short supply. Um, and this is just, uh, and I'll keep moving to, to keep us on, uh, on time with, uh, with Mike. Um, and then the contracting approach should align to the strategic ambitions and, and or the business uh, constraints that you may, that you may face. So, in particular, we see a lot of business cases that get built um, that they either have a misalignment to, uh, to the strategy of that organisation. So when they come forward for approval, it just gets bogged down in, uh, in making sure it has to go back and be realigned. In understanding how it's going to be funded, 
um, because most of these then either go through to a, a separate government agency or DTF type organisation to, to look at. So understanding the basics of, of how it's looking to be, uh, to be funded. And then the risk appetite and risk allocation. So what is the appetite of, of, of our organisation to, uh, to undertake this project? And how are we contemplating the risk allocation? Nothing is stopping us doing a high level risk allocation before we go to market to say we want the market to take all delivery risk or we want to, we're happy to share it. We want the market to take all price risk or we're happy to, to share it. Those two topics are front and centre of, of the delivery partners at the moment. Um, you know, people talk about CPI and escalation, which in, 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 uh, in historical terms it was either 2.5% um, or, uh, or lower. Um, at the moment, that risk is now being pushed back into, uh, into the customer uh, world and, and delivery partners are not prepared to, to take it, given it can be anywhere from 5 to 10% from, from year on year, uh, in particular when there's, uh, when there's offshore supply um, at, uh, involved. Alignment to, to government policy, that, that's a fairly vanilla um, comment, but it really is to make sure that there is alignment. It's, it's working towards the 80% uh, recycling target in this case. Um, what, what's the approach on innovation? Like, are we looking for the market to provide an innovative solution? Are we looking just for the, the bare bones of, uh, of an infrastructure solution? So making sure we understand what our own expectations are in regards to, to innovation, because that feeds into how it's delivered and then how it's operated. And looking at these projects, not just from a point of view of the upfront capex, but the long-term um, operations and maintenance and whole of life costing for these facilities is equally important as the, the, the sticker shock people get for, uh, for the DNC. Um, the, the 20 year, 15 year horizon, whether it's in-sourced or outsourced, it doesn't really matter, but m keeping an eye on that longer term uh, whole of life costing feeds into um, the, uh, the value for money assessment. And so understanding that before you jump into the market um, uh, will certainly help in, uh, in looking at uh, business case approvals and then moving into, into procurement. Um, selecting of the, the contracting model, um, quite often uh, isn't given due consideration um, at the right time. It's always um, clearly decided upon but um, these sorts of things should be looked at very upfront. Um, a, a detailed assessment should be uh, undertaken to come up with a recommendation. It might be that, that the organisation or, or the council um, has a fixed way of doing things and that's fine, but just, just testing that, making sure that that aligns uh, to the market and what the market's prepared to, uh, to undertake should be, uh, should be done. And there's nothing new in any of this. There are a variety of models from, from PPPs through to self-performance and a whole combination um, in between. It, and when, when looking at which one do we choose, you need to look at um, your approach to pricing, your approach to risk, your approach to innovation, and, uh, and then the approach to flexibility. Is this a complex project that we're looking to do? Is there process risk? Is there timing risk and on accelerated program, those factors feed into the delivery model that, that you choose versus I simply want a hard and fast DNC or a hard and fast O&M contract if it's on an accelerated path, you might need a more flexible approach and, and ultimately in theory that should save money versus landing yourself in dispute world which, which then takes time and, uh, and costs money and ultimately delays a, uh, a project. And just the last section, uh, just the, some shared experiences and learnings. Um, and these are really just, again, provided for, for, for reference. It's not to say, um, I, I think I agree, I'm not sure who said it, but every project is different and every approach to project is different. There is no one size fits all in, what, uh, in how to go about uh, procurement. Um, but there are certainly a number of, of common themes that we've seen in the past few years um, and, and none of these are anything but common sense, but they quite often get skipped over because we're on a, a critical path to get our, our project into the market or we just need a new transfer station built. But 
you know, understanding who the key stakeholders are, understanding your budgetary and funding constraints and or arrangements, what are the political um, aspects of, of the project and uh, the contractual and risk allocation side of things. So, so working that up in a manner that A, satisfies your own stakeholders but B, um, is appreciative or I guess accepting of where the market is at and that market is changing. Um, and then, yeah, lastly looking at, uh, at those market constraints. And they exist, they are real. Um, working on a number of projects at the moment where in some ways doing the market sounding is as much about promoting our projects to the market as it is about trying to get feedback from the market as to what new shiny toys these guys have available to help solve our infrastructure problem. And that's not specific to, to waste, that's, that's across a, a variety of infrastructure projects. So um, it, it is about promoting a, a positive, organised uh, approach to, uh, to your uh, procurement. Uh, risk allocation, I won't, I won't go into, uh, into detail on that, but that really is a, a, a key topic. It, it's a key topic um, on understanding what risks exist uh, and how to best allocate those risks. Um, the more that can be done up front in setting your own expectations of how you want the risk managed feeds into the procurement process. As soon as you get into running a, an EOI, an RFP process without having a clear vision on, uh, on risk allocation, you just run the risk itself, another risk, of the, the whole process extending out. Um, so, so working up your commercial framework, working up your risk allocation, engaging with the market on those points to say, guys, what do you think about this? Is this something that is attractive to you or is it a, a no-go area? They will give you that feedback and yes, they will give it in a manner that is perhaps tainted towards their own, own preferences, but they'll at least give you a, a sense of direction. So just in, in, in summary on uh, key, I guess, key points to, to note, um, it's getting that communication going, not just internally within, within your own organisation, but that, that market communication. Um, define your requirements, define them as early as you can versus uh, doing it once you've started the procurement process. Because you can lose some of your negotiation power if you're on the back foot versus being up front. It promotes confidence uh, to the market. And set realistic timeframes and, and make sure the resources are in place. You know, procuring infrastructure is complex. It is not a straightforward process. It's not the, it's not the equivalent of, of looking at a a long-term waste supply agreement with a Veolia or clean away. It is, there is risk involved, there is time involved, and there's expertise required um, that exists and, and, and should be uh, put into, the, into these uh, projects. And uh, yeah, that's really what I wanted to cover off. There's no, there's no right or wrong answer to that. I mean, from a personal perspective, I, I'd like to see local government take on uh, a greater responsibility for, for development of, of infrastructure to look after their own, uh, uh, their own requirements. Um, but, yeah, I think it's unlikely. It's, uh, it's been highlighted today that we've got a massive infrastructure gap to achieve what well, our targets are set up for for 2030 and beyond. What do you think is the greatest risk or hurdle that procurement and development of the required infrastructure in the waste sector is today? There's no one specific hurdle. I think, I think that as from the developer um, 
side, the, the, the risk is we are going to be competing for limited resources of those able to, to deliver. So just being aware of that factor and therefore being more organised. That's probably, to me, uh, a key point. And that's, I'm not in, at all saying that means we need to be uh, aligned to, to the delivery partners. That's just realising where the sector is at the moment and the fact that you know, I can, someone can go and build a, a, a $5 billion road or a tunnel um, where it is, I guess, a more proven uh, infrastructure delivery uh, project as compared to a, a recycling uh, facility that has process risk, technology risk, volume risk. Um, it's about building up our, our ability to, to plan for that, to communicate that, so that our projects are more attractive into the market. Feel free to collar our speakers outside, but would you please uh, thank uh, all of our speakers with me? And, uh, and can I wish you all well for tonight? There are shuttle buses and doing. I'm not sure that I'm supposed to give any messages about that, but there are shuttle buses going to dress ups, and it's red wine o'clock in a few minutes. So thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>